Okay, so in this video, we're going to go over the first part of the discussion on the functional anatomy associated with the spinal column. So when we look at the spinal column, just kind of looking at the different sections, there's 33 total vertebrae. So the vertebrae are the bones that make up the spinal column. Basically, you're going to have 24 vertebrae separated by discs. So those discs are going to, we're going to talk about the individual functions of the disc. And then you have what are called nine fused vertebrae. So they're essentially vertebrae that are basically continuous with one another. So there's no separation between them. So it's divided, it's divided into five regions. You have the cervical region, which is in the neck, the thoracic region, which is in the mid back, the lumbar, which is the low back, the pelvic region, which is where the sacrum is, and then the coccyx uh, or the tailbone. You can look at the illustration on the side. We're going to break this down further so you could see the, um, the individual sections. So here we look at the actual relationship of the disc to the, um, to the vertebrae. So if you look here, you can see here's your disc. Okay, now the disc is actually composed of two, of two parts. You have the outer portion, which is known as the annulus fibrosus. So that's kind of the uh, portion that gives structure to the outside of the disc. And then inside, you have the nucleus pulposus, okay, which is the more watery type uh, portion of the disc, okay? So some people liken the disc to very similar to a jelly donut, okay? Now, most of you have probably heard of a disc herniation. So a disc herniation is essentially, and there's different levels and types of, of herniated discs. But basically what happens is the disc somehow gets distorted and it usually involves some amount of displacement of this middle portion of the disc. You can also get a degenerate, degenerative disc where the disc actually breaks down and loses its um, liquid portion to of it as well, um, which then that can create some, some low back issues. And you see how that separates the individual vertebral bodies. If you look down here, you could see it in relation to the, the nerve roots. Now we're not going over much of the, the neural anatomy in this class, but you can see how if you have, here's your, here's your different uh, nerve roots coming out of your spinal nerve. So you can see how that kind of breaks down as well. But you know, the, what happens with a disc herniation, you can see here, you can see the spinal nerves coming out at the disc somehow herniates and puts pressure on that, you can get some uh, neurological symptoms associated with your, with your injury. So here's the spine and the different regions. Okay, so you have, if you're kind of following here, you have your cervical vertebrae, that's C1 through C7. You have your 12 thoracic vertebrae, so T1 through T12. You have the five lumbar vertebrae, L1 through L5, you have the sacrum. So now here's where we're getting into the fused bone. So again, all of these are separated by discs, okay? So you have that fibrocartilaginous disc in between each one of the vertebrae. Once you're down here at the sacrum, they're fused, okay? And there's five sacral vertebrae, and then you get down to the tailbone or the coccyx, there's four fused bones, okay? Now I will tell you this, sometimes you will look in other textbooks and they'll give you anywhere from three to five coccygeal vertebrae. We're just going to go with four um, for, for the purposes of our discussion, but you can see some variation to that in other textbooks. So we look at the vertebrae. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is what are some of the differences between the vertebrae? Because obviously, as you go through the different regions of the spine, the vertebrae become very different. However, they all have common structures. So if we look at the common structures here, you have the body, which is the anterior segment, and that's responsible for the weight bearing portion. So you'll see as we go down the spine, the bodies of the vertebrae change pretty significantly as you go down and they become uh, more responsible for, for greater weight bearing. You have the transverse processes, so they're lateral projections off of the vertebrae, and they act as an attachment site for muscles. Same thing with the spinous process, except they're a posterior projection. So you'll see a small posterior projection on the, on the vertebrae. That's also a muscle attachment site. 
you have ver the vertebral foramen. That's the hole between the body and the processes for the spinal cord. So that's the big hole in the middle where the spinal cord has to go through. And then you have the facets, which are the articulations. So they're actual joints that form between the vertebrae. So besides the, the, uh, the joint where the bodies come together, there's also the facet joints, which is on the posterior aspect of the of the vertebrae and they have each vertebrae will have both a superior and inferior articulation off of that process now again that we'll we'll note the different shapes because depending upon the region and i want you to be able to differentiate and see the differences between all the vertebrae they these all of these common structures will all have slightly different characteristics associated with them So here's a cervical vertebrae. Now, obviously, since the cervical vertebrae is not weight-bearing, they have a very small vertebral body. So if you look here, the vertebral body, which is right here, is very small, okay? They also have what's called a bifid spinous process. So the spinous process, which is right back here, has kind of a, it's bifid. It doesn't have, you know, you'll notice the spinous processes of the other vertebrae. They just come straight back. You see these two little kind of forks on the, the spinous process. Okay, so you have a split spinous process. The other unique thing about the cervical vertebrae is that the transverse processes have a hole called the transverse foramen. So right away, when you see transverse foramen, you know right away that that's a cervical vertebrae. It's the only vertebrae, they're the only vertebrae that have these holes off in the transverse processes. And the reason why they have that is it's a passageway for the, for the vertebral arteries to come through. So that's, those are the, the unique things when you look at the cervical vertebrae. So the cervical vertebrae again, or the, the upper seven. Now we say that it's C1 through C7. C1 and C2, as you're gonna see in a little bit, are our unique vertebrae with unique names and functions, and we're gonna go over them in a little bit. So here we have C1, which is known as the atlas, and that articulates with the occiput of the skull. And then we have C2, which is the axis. It articulates with C1 and C3. And if you notice, there's a, there's a process on C2 the axis known as the dens, okay? This is the dens here. This large process allows for rotation to take place at the, at the cervical spine. So these two vertebrae come together. This process here is what allows for your rotation to take place at the cervical vertebrae. So you notice looking at these two vertebrae, they're both very unique looking um, as far as their structure goes, but then the rest of the, the cervical vertebrae going down from C3 through C7 all look like that previous picture that I had shown you earlier. So if we look at the thoracic vertebrae, so moving down the spine, so the thoracic vertebrae have slightly larger bodies. Again, the, the, the size of the vertebral bodies are gonna increase in proportion to the weight that they, that they have to bear. Um, the, the big characteristics of the thoracic vertebrae is they have very long spinous processes that generally angle downward. So you'll see when you look at the spine, that the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae are very long and they point down and they have specialized facet joints for the ribs. So the ribs all articulate, and we're gonna talk about the anatomy of the ribs within this, uh, within this chapter because they're relevant as far as the, the functional anatomy of the torso, but they actually articulate. So, and the ribs articulate with both the body of the thoracic vertebrae and also the transverse processes. So there's actually two different joints that articulate with those, uh, with the ribs as they come along and into the back. So all the thoracic vertebrae have a corresponding rib that will go along with them. So again, there's 12 thoracic vertebrae. So you can see in the picture here what the thoracic vertebrae look like. Um, and again, we're also showing you the, the articulation with the ribs. So if you kind of look at this picture here, okay, here, here's also some other bony 
uh, bony landmark. So the pedicle is this little bony area in here. So make note of that. Again, here's the, here's the vertebral body. Notice they're getting much larger, okay? You can see where the ribs articulate as well, okay? And then here you have, here's another bony landmark, which we, we didn't talk about in the previous, but this is the lamina. So the lamina is between the transverse process and the, and the spinous process. Here's the spinous process here. You'll notice that it's not bifid anymore. Here's a, here's a transverse, uh, or here's a thoracic vertebrae up here. Here's your spinous process. It doesn't have that bifid appearance. Again, here's your transverse processes here. You can't see in this picture. Um, I have some other pictures of vertebrae where you'll see kind of the downward angle, but basically the, the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae points downward, okay? Here you can kind of see the ribs and you can see the different articulations where the ribs actually come into contact with the individual thoracic vertebrae. And then you have the lumbar vertebrae. So there's five lumbar vertebrae. These have the largest body and that's because of the, the weight bearing responsibility that they have. They also have spinous processes that are very short and thick. Same thing with the transverse processes. So again, you, you already have some, some kind of character, unique characteristics to each one of the different types of vertebrae. So in looking at a vertebrae, you should be able to tell simply by looking at a, at a picture of it, what type of vertebrae it is just based upon these different characteristics that we've described. So here's a lumbar, here's a picture of lumbar vertebrae. So again, you notice very large vertebral body. Notice that the processes are very thick and short. Okay, characteristic of the, the lumbar vertebrae. Here you have a couple different pictures showing you the relationship. You can also see the, the intervertebral discs. So disc concerns tend to be very big into the, the lumbar spine because of the, the, the forces that get kind of transmitted there. Um, but you can see the different um, processes in this picture. And, and again, we'll see some other uh, variations of this in the lab as well. Then as we go further down the, the spine, you can see the sacrum and the, and the, and the coccyx. Um, so here you can see the sacrum and, and the coccyx. Again, these are fused vertebrae. So the sacrum is five vertebrae fused to form one bone. We kind of talked about the, the sacrum a little bit when we, we talked about the hip because of the, the relationship with the, the pelvic bones. Um, two large articular surfaces provide attachments with the pelvis. So obviously your, your two pelvic bones, your two innominate bones, both attached to the sacrum. And then you have your coccyx, which again, also known as the tailbone. Uh, four vertebrae fused together. Again, you might see some variations. Some other sources might say anywhere from three to five. Um, we're just gonna say there's four. And that again, serves as an attachment sites for, for different ligaments and some soft tissue. Then here's your intervertebral disc. So a little better picture here where you can see the different parts of the intervertebral discs. Um, so these are cartilaginous discs that form between each vertebral body. So the intervertebral joints, there's basically two joints at the spine, you know, where the vertebrae come together. You have the intervertebral joint and that's the joint that's filled with the disc. And then you have the facet joints which are come off of the, the articular processes on the back part of the, the vertebrae. So when you look at the discs, you have again your two parts. You have the outer ring, which is the annulus fibrosus. So that's the tough fibrous outer part. And then the inner part, which is the nucleus pulposus, which is very fluid-like, okay? And again, those discs are there to provide some shock absorption. Obviously, if there becomes trauma to the disc, that's when the disc could change shape. It could degenerate that inside that nucleus pulposus could leak out um, and you know depending upon the the type of injury or pathology that you have but this disc form or fill the space in between the vertebral body so you can see that right in here again that's the intervertebral joint when you get into the back here so i mentioned that other joint this is the other joint where the where the vertebrae come together at again what are called the facet joints in the spine, okay? So here's the intervertebral joint, which is a, um, an ampiarthrodial joint filled with the fibrocartilage. And then you have the gliding joint in the back, uh, 
which is your facet joint. 